All right, we are concluding Ecclesiastes chapter 10 this morning, moving on to chapter 11. Uh, We've noted as Solomon has been giving practical wisdom, practical application uh, to those who are reading this book of wisdom, uh, and he describes the importance so much in chapter 10, really the, the, the contrast between being wise and being foolish. That, that seems to be kind of the, the main thing that he's going for. Uh, he describes the need to, what all everything we find to do with our hands, do it with all our might, that type of thing. He carries that into verses 18 and 19. <coughs> Uh, the need to make sure that that we're vigilant and that we're being diligent to make sure that we're taking care of our responsibilities. And that's what verse 19 is about. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. He's not saying that money is everything. He's saying that money is what we need to survive. Okay, yeah, maybe having feast, you know, is it, fun and everything, But ultimately, if you give yourself to that type of stuff, that you're not going to have what you need to survive. You're not going to have what you need to pay your bills and to be able to sustain yourself. Verse 20, as we ended last week, we were discussing verse 20. It says, Do not curse the king even in your thought. Do not curse the rich even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice, and a bird in flight may tell the matter. And, of course, we talked about the practical application of any time you say anything, even if you think you're alone, you never, you, there might be somebody walking by, there might be somebody who's eavesdropping, trying to find something evil to say of you. You never know what somebody might be uh, trying to do to, to get you in trouble or whatnot. And as a result, we need to be very careful what we say. And certainly that's a practical application of this. But notice that even in your thoughts, don't curse the king. Okay, and of course, this carries forward into Romans chapter 13 in the New Testament uh, about respecting those who are in authority. And of course, that's really what Solomon's getting at. And all through these last several chapters, he has dealt with this concept of influence and power that the rich and those in positions of authority, like the king, that they have. And the temptation of those who are poor and lowly uh, is to resent those who are in positions of authority or those who are wealthy. Uh, And it's important, and really what Solomon's kind of addressing, there's the practical side of it, but there's also the very attitude of it. Okay, Don't don't resent them, don't hold it against them, even if, let's say, and of course this isn't a part of Solomon's point, but even if they're corrupt, okay, even if they're corrupt, Okay, they're corrupt, and if the law can prove that, that's, that's fine, if that's applicable in your, in your government. But if it's a situation where the king is selfish, and he's mean, and he's, you know, whatever, you still have to obey the king. As long as, as there's no uh, a law from the king that, that prevents us from serving God, we still have to obey the king. And that's part of what Solomon's dealing with, is these positions of, of wealth and power that sometimes those in, in a lower state in society or in, in, in uh, authority, that sometimes they can hold that against them. And his point is you need to be careful. Be sure to be wise, not only in your words and what you say and don't say, but even in your thoughts. Okay? And as we ended last week, we noted our words are often dictated by our thoughts. We know that. Okay? Sometimes we think without speaking. Sometimes What we think about a matter will, even if we don't intend for it to come out in what we say, sometimes things we imply, things we kind of say without saying, that type of thing, can be understood by others. And it's very important that we're careful with with what we do and how we do that. Any thoughts through verse 20? All right. Chapter 11. Anything through chapter 10? Chapter 11. All right. So chapter 11, uh, Solomon is continuing this concept of practical application regarding wisdom. But notice how he starts in verse 1, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Okay, 
Again, carrying forward some of the proverb type of language from the Proverbs that we kind of discussed last week a little bit there in chapter 10. What does he mean by cast your bread upon? Why would you want bread that you threw on the water a couple of days ago? Who, who would eat that? Anybody that's starving. Okay, well that's true. Yeah, I guess anybody that's starving, although I, I don't know. I, I, might, I might would have to find something else. Um, it says you will find it after many days. Is he talking about bread? Is that what his point is? Okay. So he's not talking about bread. What is he talking about? I thought I heard somebody's, somebody say something. Okay, yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, uh, in fact, there are times where you know people refer to investing here in terms of monetary, uh, being good stewards, okay? And this might be one verse if you're thinking about you know verses that apply to being a good steward. This might be one of those. Being wise in what you do. Of course, uh, unnecessary risks and, and, and things for the ultimate goal of just of, of being rich. That's not what Solomon's point is. When he describes this, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. There is a sense in which, yeah, there's the, the specific application of that in terms of, of using your money wisely and investing and so forth, if that's applicable. But the sense of doing something and not needing an immediate return on your effort is kind of the ultimate point. Okay, It, it kind of speaks against this society's feeling of immediate uh, gratification, Okay, instant gratification where I put in an effort and I want to see immediate results. And what Solomon offers here, this really falls hand in hand with some of the stuff he was saying earlier about um, uh, making sure that we're working with our hands. And, and uh, he describes the, uh, how the, the house, what was it, verse 18, the laziness of the building decays and through idleness of hands the house leaks. Okay, being di- diligent and vigilant. But there's also a recognition that sometimes it's going to take time for that effort to show any result. And you know what? There's a bit of patience that is necessary in that process. And, and an understanding that it may be many days, it may be a week, it may be a year, but eventually there's going to be an acknowledgement, even if nobody else knows about it. Okay, What's going to happen in judgment? Who will have known about the good that you did? God. God will. Okay, and so it's not necessary to have this con- constant need for instant results and instant gratification. You know, there are some things that naturally are, they just have show immediate results, and then there's some things that just don't. And we just have to accept that and be okay with that. Anything else to verse 1? Yeah, sure. Sure, you, you may not see immediate results. Many years later, well, yeah. some of the things that you've taught them. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back to them. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of application in terms of, of understanding that the efforts that you put forward, whether it's in training children or anything else, trying to study with a friend or a loved one, uh, sometimes those results aren't going to be uh, as immediate as we would like. Okay? But you know what? Sometimes it takes time for things to really sink into somebody. And unfortunately, sometimes the vast majority of times it seems like people who weren't interested at all in the gospel, the reason they become interested is because of some tragedy that happens. Okay, Some loved one passes away or somebody becomes sick and it causes some issue in a person's life. And that's, and that's good because it reminds them of their mortality. It reminds them they have a soul. And that's part of... Uh, what the kind of the mindset of a human being of mankind is kind of what it is is sometimes it takes things to kind of pierce our little bubble of reality to make us realize we're not invincible and life isn't forever and we really need to take stock of our souls so yeah absolutely that application is there too yeah anything else through verse one verse two so give a serving to seven and also to eight for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. 
give a serving to seven and also to eight. What does that mean? Does that mean it? Go ahead. Seven often carries the idea of completion or fullness, and eight, you're going above and beyond. You're extending yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Going the extra mile is kind of a phrase that we use a lot of times. In particular, when he applies it, the seven to, serving to seven and also to eight, in what way, what kind of serving? Give a serving. What, what does that mean? Okay, be generous. There is this generosity that is, that is involved. It's the idea of serving, you know, serving food, uh, serving in some way to, to give people sustenance. It's kind of the imagery that Solomon's bringing out. But the idea of generosity, the idea of being willing to give even beyond what is required, even if they don't take it, even if they don't accept it, but being willing to offer it, okay, that's part of Solomon's, this idea of wisdom. It's very proactive. Okay, remember we talked about that last week, kind of the difference between reactive and proactive, going back to the laziness of the hands and the house decays and so forth. That concept of being proactive and maintaining certain aspects of our character, uh, that's part of what Solomon's kind of bringing in here in chapter 11 as well. Verse 2, he says, For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. What does that mean? You don't know what evil's going to be on the earth. Notice he says, on the earth. Okay, not that it's evil, obviously no evil sent from God. But what evil on earth could he be talking about, Nolan? <coughs> Riches are not eternal. And I hear in these first couple of verses the idea of selflessness. God's not opposed to us being successful in business or an endeavor or sure. project. But then what do you do with it? Right. Jesus, in the gospel, talking to the rich young man, <coughs> doing very well, but it was all about himself. What I'm going to do for me, lay up for many years, and blah, blah, blah. You know, what should we do with that? Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, the charge to those who are rich, be ready you know, to do good works. And right. To Willing to give. To yeah. Others, this is about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and ultimately, the application comes into you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know, and that's something he dealt with in chapter 9 and chapter 10, what evil may come tomorrow. Okay? So be generous today. Because you never know how that might actually be a benefit later at some point. You know, to, to know that you have been generous to somebody and then that person has some terrible situation in their life that happened and they are so thankful to you that you were there for them or whatever. That kind of, of impact and influence can really help others because you don't, you don't know what's going to happen. So be generous. Have that mentality. Have that mindset because you just don't know when that generosity might actually be of, of more help than you might think to someone. It may call somebody to, to really look into uh, what congregation you attend and, and what you teach and what you believe. You just never know what might happen that may call somebody to say, you know what, this person has been consistent. This person has been uh, practicing what they teach all the time. And if I'm going to ask anybody about the soul and God and church, I'm going to ask them. Okay? And because generosity certainly is living out in our life the concept of being selfless. Yeah. Anything else through verse 2? Yes, sir. Oh. Solomon has spent so much time in this book talking about how life doesn't work the way it should or the way we think it should. The wicked and the fools prosper and the wise are forgotten and the righteous are, are uh, persecuted. With, with all of that in mind, uh, Rick said, are, are we going to try to play it safe, uh, hedge against every calamity? Right. Solomon is saying, no, that is not the way to live. He can go on to say, uh, you know, three falls toward the south, that's where it lies. I mean, that's so obvious. Right. As we say sometimes, it is what it is. Yeah. Deal with it and get on with your life. Right. Enjoy your life. Work hard at what you do. Be generous. Don't just pinch every penny because hard times make. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, Joe. Probably could help those individuals, but 
you in a sense are helping yourself in the New Testament. Jesus talks about the people who make friends of people of this world. And he says, they're wise in their generation. Because when evil times come, it's a self-preservation technique as well. And Jesus, he's not saying that it's good to do evil. Right. But I think Solomon's kind of pointing for the same thing here. You don't know what evil's going to happen, so you're protecting yourself, but you obviously should do these things right. as a character. Right. But secondarily, in fact, it can preserve myself later on sure. in times of evil. Yes, it could help those individuals right. as well to see a person who's doing what they're supposed to do, but it can help myself when the evil times come that I have kind of hedged my bet. Right. Right. Not not that we're doing it for the purpose of receiving something back, but that that could be a uh, secondary benefit, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Anything else through verse two? <coughs> verse three. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That happens, doesn't it? <laughs> And if a tree falls in the forest, can you hear it? No, that's not what he says. If a tree falls to the north or the south, that's where it's going to lie, right? Yeah. Well, as James pointed out, one aspect or application of this is there are things that are going to happen that happen as a natural result of life, right? Clouds fill with rain. With water, it's going to rain. All right? That's just a natural process of our, of our environment. It's the way God set it up. And when trees fall... They're going to stay where they lie. In the end, things are going to be what they're going to be, and you have to simply live the character and manifest the character that God wants you to have and adapt. I mean, ultimately, and that's really one of the perhaps the most, one of the most important things to teach our children is that in the midst of being consistent in our character, we have to adapt to ever-changing circumstances in our lives because you never know what's going to happen. And because of those changing circumstances, we have to learn to be versatile. But at the same time, to be consistent in application, no matter what the circumstances, be consistent in application of God's Word and show forth that character. Nola? Would a simplified version of this be go on living because if you wait for the perfect conditions, yeah. be waiting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and there's a lot of applications of that, primarily the spiritual one. You know, a lot of people wait until they feel like it's the right time or, or they've kind of lived their youth and kind of done what they wanted to do to have fun and now they'll come to God. But there's also applications to it, not to say that we shouldn't be wise and when we buy a house or, you know, when our, our spouse and I decide to have children or whatever. But you know what? If you're waiting for the perfect time to do anything, that's never going to happen. There's never going to be a perfect ideal because guess what? Life isn't perfect and life isn't ideal. That's just the way it goes. I mean, may things might, all, all your ducks might be in a row the way you want them and some random event may change everything. And you just never know what's going to happen. So you know what? Trust God, first of all, and live the life that he wants you to live with the character that he wants you to have and then just go about your business. Okay, adapt to what happens, but, but don't wait as if, uh, especially in, this, in, in, in particular, the spiritual application that Nolan brought out, you wait too long before you choose to serve God, and you know what? That, that time may be past. You know, you bring up, or Peter brings up the, is it Peter or the Hebrew writer that brings up Esau and how that he sought repentance diligently with tears but it was too late. Okay, it was too late. And he couldn't receive repentance after that. He sought it diligently with tears. But you know what? Once the, the blessing was given, it's given. And there is no way to go back and fix it. And unfortunately, that's going to be true for a lot of people in judgment, is that they're going to wish that they'd had just five more minutes. Five more minutes. Let me go get baptized. It's not going to work. Not going to happen. Anything else through verse 3? Yes, sir. mental condition or state of man. There's so many things that happen in life. People are driven to depression, anxiety, worries. And a lot of things in this book, as, as 
James has pointed out a number of times in this study. If you just realize that's how life is, it doesn't always work perfectly, learn to accept the good or the bad, but keep living, keep moving forward, I think there's application to that where I'm also. Sure. Sure, it, it can definitely help to, and this is part of the reason why Ecclesiastes, uh, and there have even been Christians I've known that felt like Ecclesiastes was such a depressing book. And, and I've been very careful to make it clear that, that this is not, Solomon didn't write this to be depressing, and it's not depressing. In fact, if anything, it's meant to help us refocus and to have the proper perspective so that we can have joy. <laughs> So that we can live a life that is, is enjoying the fruit of our labor and enjoying what God has given us so that we can appreciate properly the fact that, you know what, tomorrow it may be gone. So you know what, use what the time that you have in service to God and enjoying the fruit of your labor because tomorrow it, it may be the end and you just never know. And so in a lot of ways, when you, when you look through this application, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, he is saying that of the mindset not just of the pursuit of the flesh and, and uh, of stuff. It's the mindset and attitude of people of the world without God. That's what ultimately the vanity of vanity, all is vanity. That's what it is. The mindset of people without God, it is it, the pursuits and their enjoyments and their thought process, it's all vain. Whereas the thought process of those who are wise, those who seek to serve God, they understand it's vain. And they accept that and then they live their life. Okay, they accept, yeah, all of this is vanity. So I'm going to live the way God wants me to because that's not vanity. Anything else through verse 3? Verse 4. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. This is a little bit different. Because he doesn't specifically, obviously, man has no control over the clouds and the rain. And he doesn't say that people are cutting down trees. Sometimes trees just fall down. But here in verse 4, man's included in this particular aspect. But what's he observing? Practical application of natural patterns in nature, right? He who uh, observes the wind will not sow. There are certain times, especially, you know, back in Solomon's time especially, but there obviously this applies to seasons, but even certain weather. It might not be beneficial to sow in this type of weather and certainly in this type of season or whatnot. That comes from observation and it's practical wisdom. Okay, And then he says, he who regards the clouds will not reap. You don't want to go trying to harvest in a thunderstorm and, and certainly you can't harvest at certain times of, of the year, but it's that... It's that it's not just nature itself that Solomon's pointing out. It's man's ability to observe the nature of, in this case, of the earth, the nature of how the, the various systems God has put in place work, and we adapt to those, don't we? Okay, I observe the, okay, I, the wind is such, I'm not going to sow at this point in time. I'll sow later at a different point in time where it's better. Okay. The adaptation to be able to do that and to observe this, and, and that's part of wisdom, is being able to have knowledge, there's the observation, and then to come to the conclusion and application of adapting. There's the wisdom. Anything through verse 4? Verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Verse 5, he brings God in. And this is it's kind of interesting because throughout Ecclesiastes, hey, I mean, obviously God is mentioned uh, from time to time, but it, he's kind of, it's more of an implication of God and the service to God, the implication of the wise versus the foolish and, and the righteous versus the wicked. Here in verse 5, there are certain things that we don't understand. And of course, this applies much more as he from, speaks to verse 3 and, and even verse 2 even. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, even okay, Hurricane Dorian, how many different projections were there? And it was kept tricking them. 
every which way. It'd go this way, then it'd go that way, then it'd go this way, that way. And they just didn't know. Okay? They had these projections, but they didn't know for sure. Okay? Even now, they, there's some kind of tropical storm out there that they have going and they're kind of doing a Yui and going right back out to sea. Who knows what it's going to do? Okay? As smart as we become and as, as advanced technology gets, we can know generally the circuits of the wind. But exactly how it's going to do and what it's going to do, we don't know. We don't know, even today. I mean, you, you look at your, your forecast over the next 14 days and then test it to see if any of that actually is going to be accurate. And the majority of the time, it's not going to be. Okay, It's a guess, an educated guess. How the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. There's a lot that we know, even today. But in terms of the actual process that happens... Of, of the spark of life that takes place at conception, that all of that is still beyond our ability to really scientifically quantify, to be able to, to view it and understand it. Even today, scientists can't explain how life starts. They can't. They just can't explain it. How life starts. Yet, God is in control of that, isn't he? God knows, and God knows the way of the wind, and God knows how all these systems work together in the earth. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Given, and, and now some of these, just like kind of the Proverbs, it's not necessarily a context thing. Sometimes things are just in there for sake of, of practical wisdom, and that's kind of the thread that connects everything. But in verse 5, there does seem to be some connection to these earlier verses. So when he says there at the end of verse 5, you do not know the works of God who makes everything, how should that apply, especially given what he has said already? Okay. All right. Do what you're going to do. Trust in God. Okay, that's the one thing Solomon doesn't say in verse 5, but I think there's an implication here of trust in that you don't know the works of God, which is to say God is far wiser than you. Okay, God does know. God is in control, and you have to make sure that you serve him and, and do what you're supposed to do, live the life that he wants you to live, and to a certain extent or a certain application, even though Solomon doesn't bring up worry per se, don't worry about stuff that may or may not happen. Okay? Don't worry about this or that and, and what's going to happen tomorrow because you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Live your life. Manifest the characteristics that God wants you to manifest. Let God take care of everything else. And in a lot of ways, the respect that we should have to God, stop trying to figure it out. This is God knows you're never going to know. Just leave it, leave it be. And you focus your energies on more worthwhile pursuits. Anything through verse 5? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, in a lot of ways, in fact, so we kind of uh, dealt with that a little bit in some earlier chapters of Ecclesiastes, the, the almost innate need that man has to try to control things. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a sense of security, a sense of comfort to think that I can control, even though we know all we control is me. That's it. I just control myself the feeling that I can control others or I can control events or control circumstances, the reason why we talk about, especially in science fiction, time machines and superpowers, it's this effort to try to change things, to fix things, to control things. And it doesn't work that way. So yeah, I, I think there's absolutely an application there in verse 5 of, of trust God, don't try to, to control because you can't. You don't know. There's a lot of stuff you don't know. And leave it in God. Leave it with God. Anything else to verse 5? Verse 6. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why when we talk about that, and of course that's something that comes up routinely throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, is trusting in God, not worrying, being anxious for nothing, and so forth. 
a lot of times it's because we have to remind ourselves, okay? Because it is easier said than done. It's not just some fl- a switch you can flip and say, okay, I'm not going to worry now. But it's something we have to work at. Some of us are, are better at it maybe than others. Some of us maybe have more on our plate to have to not worry about than, than others. Uh, but it, it's kind of a part of that growth process of trusting that God will take care of this. You do what you're supposed to do. And let God take care of the rest. And yes, it is hard. It is hard. But, but it's something every one of us has to work at every day. Anything else in verse 5? Verse 6. In the morning sow your seed. In the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Now, is he negating what he says earlier in verse 4? Is he negating the, the practical application of, of observing there's times to go ahead and do this that are appropriate and times not to? Or is he making a different point? Okay, I think it's a different point. Yeah, because the context of earlier verse 4 and verse 3, there's observations you can make in nature, and you base your what you're going to do off of those observations. Those, there's a certain amount that you can see that it's wise to do this and not wise to do that. Okay? But verse 6 seems to be more connected with verse 5. In that, in the morning, there's, this is the declarative. Sow your seed. Okay? Take, take your seeds. Go out in the farm. Sow your seed. In the evening, do not withhold your hand. You put forth that work. You put forth your labor. Don't pick and choose things simply because either you don't want to or I don't think this is going to work. Not because of practical observation, as he says in verse 4, but just because of arbitrary decisions or, or, or worry that this may work, this may not work. I don't know if it's going to work or not. That seems to be more of what he's describing. For you don't know which will prosper. Uh, this land is, is real... Real good, this part, this area of the farm is real fertile, but, but this other side, the grass is kind of brown, and I don't know if the, the if I throw, throw seeds there, if it's going to work. You know what? Throw it anyway. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Go ahead and throw the seed, whether both alike might be good. You don't know. There are certain things. He's not saying take unnecessary risks. That's not the application. But what he is saying, he's saying, listen, don't, don't second guess yourself, okay? There's a, there's a phrase that we use often in sports: "You're thinking too hard," okay? And in fact, a lot of times you see quarterbacks they're holding the ball too long, they they double clutch, triple clutch, they're thinking too much, okay? They're thinking too hard about it, and and that can be a problem that you and I face in all kinds of ways in life: is that we're thinking too much about it. You know what? I have the seed. I need to sow it. Then sow it. <laughs> Don't, don't second guess yourself. Don't, don't think too much about it. Just do what you're going to do and let it go and see what's going to happen. Maybe both alike will be good. You don't know. Application through, or uh, any comments through verse 6. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. That could be. That could be. I hadn't read that from verse 4 before. That could be. Also, at the end, to me, there's a, the single word in verse 5 is the great contrast here. We're trying to figure out one little thing, one process out of the God who doesn't, he's not bound by the Son. Like right. The son. Yeah. He makes everything. Yeah. I mean, we're so worried about how this thing can be perfect and get just right. He's made everything. Again, don't try to figure it all out. Right. It's not our part of this. Right. And of course, the broader application certainly isn't just with being a farmer. It deals with life, just as verse 5 and verse 4, verse 3 is, is the concept of, of in our lives, sometimes you can think too much about a thing. Okay, Take all the facts that you can, make, make an advised decision, sure. 
okay, an educated decision, but sometimes you're not going to know how something's going to turn out, and that's okay. That, and, and again, that goes back to trusting in God. He's made everything. He's in control. You do what you have to do and take care of things and do what, you, what you're supposed to do, and, and don't, don't double and triple guess yourself. Okay? Trust that God, one way or the other, is going to take care of things. It may not be the way we want, but he'll take care of things. You do what you've got to do. Again, going back to what Ms. Ruby said, it, it, it's easy to say, hard to do, though, right? Anything else through verse 6? Sometimes the farmer plants in the ideal conditions and the crop still doesn't happen. Still fail, yeah. yeah. Or there might be a drought, okay, in, in perfect, perfect uh, type of place with, with supposed to be fertile ground, and there's a drought, okay? Sometimes things like that happen. Sometimes you're farming somewhere, and all of a sudden you get an abundance of, of water, and sometimes that can be a bad thing. You know, you just never know. Anything else to verse 6? Verse 7. Truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. All right. Truly the light is sweet. Connecting to the end of verse 7, what light is he talking about? Specifically, he talks about the sun, right? When he describes verse 8, and he says, Man lives many years, rejoices them all, let him remember the days of darkness, they will be many. He's talking about sun, he's talking about dark, in a more abstract way, when he describes kind of the, the life of a person. What might he be describing regarding light and dark? Good times and bad times. Okay, good times and bad times. And that's why he uses it in this phrase, the light and the sun versus darkness, okay, or, or what would commonly be nighttime. Okay, there's, there's good times and bad times, and we all know that. Everybody, we all know that there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times. And if we're extremely blessed, we'll have as many good times as we will have had bad times. Okay, and I've, I've, had, I had, I've heard some, an older, older person say that she had terrible things that happened in her life. And, and that's one of the things she said, is that if you're extremely blessed, you'll have just as many good times that took place as bad things that took place. And, and it goes to show that there should be no expectation for having a 80% good time life. Okay? That, that should not be the expectation. She said it, it, ultimately it's in how you handle those things that makes the difference. That you can still have joy even in the bad times. This is describing, though, the, the difficult times, the sorrowful times, the, you know, the times where, where it, it's, it's kind of just an a, a effort just to get through the day. Truly, the light is sweet. The good times are sweet. It's pleasant for the eyes okay, to enjoy those times of, of, of happiness. Okay? Not, so joy, because joy is different, of happiness, of things where things, times are good, there's very little on our plate to worry about or to deal with. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. Okay, so we get the, the, the comparison between the good days and the bad days. He rejoices in them all, okay? It's not to say he was happy every day, but he rejoices in them all. But he remembers the days of darkness, that there were times, that there were hard times that we had to get through and difficult uh, times we didn't have much money and so forth. What does he mean at the end of that? All that is coming is vanity. All that was was vanity? It doesn't sound like he's talking about the days that were before him. You know, when he was living through his life, many years, or many days. Yeah, many years. In context, the end result of life under the sun is a conclusion, an ending. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You have one Christian who has lived a life where, let's say, 80% of their days were darkness. It was just a difficult life. 
loved ones passed away, uh, diseases, poor health, and, and very little money, so forth. You have another Christian who's, let's say, although I don't necessarily think that this is necessarily accurate, but let's say you have a Christian who's 80% of their days were nothing but perfect. Okay? Happiness and joy and, and wealth and, and everything they could possibly need. Okay? In the end, when they both die, what will be the deciding factor in judgment? How they lived, right? How they lived. And in the end, when he says all that is coming is vanity, the idea is that the conclusion that Nolan talked about is that when you consider a person's entire life, the good days and the bad ultimately are vanity, from the perspective that ultimately what really matters is whether you served God or not. Now, in terms of having good memories and even bad memories, those serve to, to motivate us sometimes. Okay? They can serve a purpose under the sun. But in the end, when you look back on your life and you think about the hard times, you think about the good times, you think about the times of sorrow, ultimately, the real question is going to be is how have you served God? either despite the good times and despite the bad times, or because of the good times and because of the bad times. It can go either way. And so in a lot of ways, kind of what I take away from verse 8 anyway, is that when you look back on your life, there are going to be many days of darkness. All that is coming is, is vanity, in the sense that it not, he's not just talking about the days ahead of him. Certainly, generally, as we age, there's there's harder days ahead because our bodies start to wear out and deteriorate. So certainly that, that can be part of it. But, but the ultimate concept is, the implication is, how have you served God? Because again, vanity, everything associated with vanity has been under the sun, hasn't it, in Ecclesiastes? So all that is coming is, is under the sun. All of that has been vain, if not for your service to God. So whether you've had a happy life, okay, or sometimes people blame their circumstances, their life, for how they turned out and the decisions that they make. Ultimately, is there going to be anybody in judgment say, God, I grew up in this situation, I had this type of, of adversity, and I, I was sorrowful all my, all my youth, and this is why I made these decisions. It's not my fault. No. No. Despite those circumstances, can we still serve God? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Nolan? Absolutely. Absolutely. May not be happy, but like we talked about, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is a state of mind. All right. We'll stop there. We will pick up with verse 8 and verse 9 next week. Thank you, everybody, for the thoughts and comments.